Good morning and welcome to Cross Point again. My name is Cale Courtright, the preaching minister here, and we are so glad that you are here to worship with us today. Uh, th- today we are starting a new sermon series called Allegiance. I told you a little bit about it last week. Now, we just finished up three weeks on unity, and that was by no accident. Because we know that there is something that joins us together, something that unifies us here that is stronger, that is more important than anything that would divide us out in the world. And make no mistake, the world is trying to divide us. And so we have been thinking about this for a long time. We know that this is something that's on our hearts and minds, and so we thought we should talk about it. Now, a couple things before we get started today. We have spent a lot of time praying about, thinking about, reading about this series. And you're going to hear some things that may cause your interest to be piqued. It may, you may have questions. There may be things that uh, kind of get under your skin or ruffle some feathers. And when that happens, I would ask you to do two things. The first thing is I would ask you to, in prayer, ask if maybe this is the Spirit rubbing an area in your life and heart that maybe needs to change. And the second thing I would ask you to do is to come talk to me about it. Rather than sit in in an area of wondering or questioning and and maybe getting, uh, if you get frustrated or whatever the case may be, uh, just come and talk about it. This is a church where pretty much anything is, is in bounds to, to question or to talk about, and so we would invite those questions. Okay, so we're going to start with prayer, and then we're going to talk about it. Got it? Not every sermon series comes with a warning, but I felt like <laughs> this, this one should. Before we get started today, would you please pray with me? Lord Jesus, you stretched out your arms of love upon the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name, amen. As we get started this morning, I have two volunteers that are going to come up for a little illustration, and so if you guys would join me up here. Now, before first service, I gave them a, it might be strong to call it a gift, but uh, go ahead and uh, adorn your fun glasses, gentlemen. As you can tell, these macho guys, these are the sunglasses they would choose. (laughs) Can't you imagine Alex on the beach with those glasses? Yeah. So let me ask some fairly obvious questions. Again, this is an illustration. Alex, what color are you seeing? I would say green. Okay. <laughs> and, and Phil, what are you seeing? I think I'm seeing orange. All right, you're seeing orange. So, so there was a debate about that color, but it is orange. So. <laughs> so two different glasses seeing two different things. Now, Alex, let me ask you, just because you're seeing green, does that make everything green? No, okay. Phil, you're seeing orange. Does that make everything orange? It does not. It is not. Okay, now we can all agree that they both look silly, right? <laughs> yes. would, you, would you tell them thank you? <laughs> we, they, are gonna, they have the freedom to just give those sunglasses away, so anyone who asks, y'all can have them. So. We all see the world through some kind of a lens. We all uh, approach our lives and the events around them, and we see it in a certain way. And so today, and and for the next few weeks, I want to talk about the lens by which we see the world. And today I want to start with confession. And we're in a church, and so when you hear the word confession, you may uh, immediately think something. But let's read starting in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, Paul has been talking about about all the things that distract us, especially our worldly possessions and riches, but he's going to turn now 
in his letter here to Timothy. And he says, verse 11, But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Now I want to stop right there for a second. Because this sermon, this sermon series, it really is going to be calling us in this nature. There are other things that may distract us, that may pull us in one way or another, but this is who we want to be, pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And he continues, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, who no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Now there is a debate when you study this passage about what kind of confession Paul might be talking about here. Again, in a church, you might immediately think of one type of confession. Confession where you have a trusted friend, a mentor, someone that you, that you care about, that you have kind of revealed parts of yourself too, and you come together and you, and you practice confession. And, and you talk about maybe the last week or the last month, and, and you say, here's where I have failed. Here's where I have missed the mark when it comes to my faith in God. And to be sure, that is a, a, an, a fair way to use confession out of your New Testament. That's an important practice that we should take as we seek to further our own righteousness as we seek to walk with Jesus. We should confess our sins. However, when the New Testament uses the word confession, this is not the primary way that it uses it. Do you remember your baptism? Do you remember the day? Do you remember the the moment leading up to it? It's one of those dates that we remember. I was baptized on August the 9th in the year 2000. It's easy for me to remember because my parents' anniversary is August the 9th. So I also never forget their anniversary. I am a good son like that. <laughs> and I was, I was 13, and I just had turned 14 in that moment. And I was, I remember asking my parents about baptism. And we, and my dad and I sat down and we studied baptism. And I, w- I grew up in one of those churches that had, had those tracks, you know, on the wall. And you could learn about all kinds of things. And so I remember we had a baptism track. And, and we got together and we studied what it means to be baptized, why we get baptized. And, and I remember saying, this is the day I want to do it. It was a Wednesday night, and it was a room much like this. And after we had had Bible class, you know, my dad and I got into the baptism. We got into, into the little pool there. And I remember thinking then, and, and even leading up to it, my dad had you know, kind of trained me. At kind of, uh, we kind of practiced what we were going to do, what we were going to say. And so he said, you know, I'm going to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? And I remember thinking, why do we ask that question? It's kind of a strange question. I was raised in a church. We went to, we were there every time the doors were open. And I remember thinking, I'm about, I I just had turned 14. And I said, I could have answered yes to that question my whole life. So what does it matter now? Isn't there a better question to ask? But but I want you to consider what what baptism is for a minute. Consider it in a different context, maybe not one like our own, where you get up in front of other people, maybe in places that aren't just, again, like our country, and you get into the water, which is supposed to symbolize your death. You climb into your grave. You climb into the place where you're going to be buried. And in front of God and all of the witnesses, you proclaim who Jesus is. You make a confession. See, confession in the New Testament context is primarily 
about declaring allegiance to Jesus and his kingdom. You can talk about confessing your sins, but this is primarily the way that Jesus uses it. Now, here's where I want to stop for a minute. And for today and for this whole series, I want to go ahead and give you my thesis for this series. My thesis for this series is that our allegiance is at stake. That our allegiance as Christ followers must be to Jesus and his kingdom. But because of the world that we live in, our allegiance is at stake. And you may remember your baptism. And you you may remember when you got up there, and, and maybe it was an easy question for you to answer. But what you did in that moment is that you confessed that Jesus is Lord and nobody else is. That Jesus is Lord, and because of that, your allegiance goes to him first and foremost. So when we declare that Jesus is Lord, we're declaring that there is no other authority that we will bow down to. Whether it's earthly kings or earthly kingdoms, whether it's the agendas of the world, that none of that gets our allegiance before Jesus Christ does. So let's go back to these this glasses example that Alex and Phil helped us with today. There are lots of ways that you can view the world. There are lots of lenses that you can use to interpret what's going on in our world. Interpret how you will go about it. For instance, today many of you are interpreting the world through your sports fandom, as you can see. It's Dallas Cowboys Sunday. It's the day that we're undefeated. And today, only the Browns can take that from us. But, but today, it, it in, I interpret it, my schedule based around that. My wardrobe, all of these types of things. And here's the thing. If you stop and think about it for a minute, you'll start to see the areas of the world, the areas in our culture that want to be the primary lens by which you see the world. But when you confess that Jesus is Lord, that is the only lens that you see the world through. We don't take, pick up glasses and take them off based on our, uh, the, the situation we find ourselves in. We don't have work glasses and home glasses and then faith glasses on Sunday morning. We have only one lens by which we see the world. That's the lens that Jesus is Lord. And through that, we reinterpret everything. And this is, there's an example of this in your scripture. In Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up before the crowd, and he is going to reinterpret their history for them. And this is what it reads. This is how it reads. Verse 29. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. Now, Jesus, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. In verse 36, he sums it up and says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Peter gives them their entire history, and he ends it with this conclusion, Jesus is Lord and Messiah. And when they, the crowd hears it, they can't help but respond. And they say, well, then what do we do? And Peter says, give your life to Christ. Repent and be baptized. Their whole, their entire history has now been reinterpreted through the lens of Jesus. And this is what we are called to do as well, to reinterpret our history, to reinterpret our world through the lens of Christ. But here's the problem. The problem is this, that we love messiahs in all of their forms. We love people who save us, who bring us things, who do do things for us. But it's a lot harder when we start talking about lords. See, lords are going to give you a rule and a law. Lords are going to be over you 
and, and requires something of you. Lords require your allegiance, your faithfulness. Lords will say things like, you cannot serve two masters. When you try to serve the one instead of me, that's what it means to be a traitor. And see, I think this can be hard for us freedom-loving Americans who say, yeah, I have this freedom. I'm in charge of my own life, my own decisions. But we have to come what we have to come to realize when we come to our biblical text is that Jesus says that I will be Lord of Lords. See, Jesus is not only our Messiah, but he is also our King. And kings have kingdoms. And so it's easy to confess Jesus with our lips while giving our allegiance to worldly kingdoms. It's easier to keep Jesus as our Savior, our Messiah, and hold him off as our Lord. But as our Lord, he does have a rule. He has a law. And the kingdoms of this world, they have different rules, different laws, different agendas, different goals than King Jesus does. And this is an issue of identity, which we'll circle back to. Many of us in here have confessed Jesus as Lord. We have committed our lives to him, our allegiance to him. But if you're anything like me, we need regular reminders of this. Regular reminders of what his kingdom is like. It's not like the world's kingdom. Jesus has an agenda and he gives us directives. He sends us out as his ambassadors. And oftentimes, the agenda of Jesus, the mission of Jesus, is going to come in conflict with the agenda of the world. The agenda of Jesus is going to come in conflict with the agendas of the world. But you and I, church, have chosen our lens. We have chosen the lens of Jesus. We do not want to see our, see our Jesus through our cultural lens, but rather we want to see the culture through the lens of Christ. Now, let me be honest with you for a minute, because I know you're all, you're all thinking it. I stand up before you today as a white, middle-class American who has lived his his entire life in either Oklahoma or Texas, which is its own kind of culture even within the grand scheme of the American culture. I do my best each and every week to put aside my culture and to come to the biblical text as true and honest as I can, but no one can completely separate themselves from the culture in which they were raised in. It's very difficult for us to to take off our cultural lenses and to see the world through the lens of Jesus. That's why it's it's difficult. That's why I love this quote by Shane Claiborne. He said, we need conversion in the best sense of the word. People who are marked by the renewing of their minds and imaginations, who no longer conform to the pattern that is destroying our world. Otherwise, we only have believers not converts. This is who we want to be. We want to lay down all of these other things, renew our own minds and imaginations. So today and the next few weeks, these are a plea to root our motives, our intentions, our passions, our desires, to root all of it in what it means to be kingdom people above all else. Now here's the deal. Our God has a different agenda than the the agenda of the world, a different mission. And one of his missions is to love the world through his people. It's not always the agenda of the world. But for you and I, church, it's going to be nearly impossible for us to shine the light of Christ in places that we neglect or with people that we consider enemies. But the confession of Jesus as Lord means that we have to view people differently. After all, Jesus called on us to love our enemies. And we must, we must consider our overall allegiance. But oftentimes we pick the wrong fights. We consider enemies and create enemies out of people that God never did. People that God does not consider an enemy, but rather a son or daughter. Here's what we know also to be true. If you were to take this seriously, the mission of Jesus, and to love your neighbor as yourself, it can take hours, weeks, months, years even, for people to trust the witness 
of a disciple of Christ. However, it can be blown up in one instance. It can be blown up with one social media post, one negative encounter, one insensitive comment. Regular confession for us is needed for, our, for us to be secure in our allegiance, to continue to grow in our allegiance to Christ. Timothy was most likely in Ephesus when Paul wrote to him. Paul also wrote a book, the book of Ephesians, to the same group of Christians. And in it, he, he calls on them to put on the armor of God, to be ready for this battle, this war that they are involved in in the world. But what you'll notice when you read the book of Ephesians is that Paul does not advocate for a Christian colony. He does not call on them to lead, leave Ephesus and go create their own place. He doesn't advocate for them to run or hide either. But rather, what Paul advocates for is for us to be rooted in their identity in Christ, rooted in their witness for him, and to engage in their culture out of that position. The fight that he calls for, the armor he asks us to put on, is for the mission of God. It's not to protect something, our past or our traditions. It's not even to protect ourselves, our family, or our livelihood. We are called to go to battle for the mission and the kingdom of God. And so your confession, your daily confession that Jesus is Lord will set the trajectory in which you live. You need a daily confession that Jesus is Lord and nothing else is. Church, I want you to take this to heart. If there are culture wars that you are passionate about, if there are political candidates that you think are the right choice, and there seems to be a loss, the kingdom of God will still advance in the world. If something that you care so much about, if it doesn't go that way, the kingdom of God is not in trouble. One of my biggest pet peeves as a church leader is when we speak in front of other people, whether it's in person or even online, and we act as if all is lost, as if our faith will be shaken by one vote. The kingdom is not in trouble, church. There's nothing on earth that can put it in trouble. And we need to live out of that victory. We don't live as if defeat is around the corner. Many of us seem to have forgotten our confession that Jesus is Lord and he is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Our confession is meant to center us, to transform us, and redirect us for him. It sets us on this trajectory to live with only one allegiance, not dozens of them. Jesus is Lord. Nothing and no one else is. Oftentimes, the way that many of us in this room would refer to ourselves, whether or not we're filling out, you know, like some kind of a survey or our demographics, and we would just say, we are American Christians. That's who we are. And to a certain degree that that is, tr that is true. The, the problem is, is when we start living like it. And many of us are going to drift into a place that we're living as if we are Americans first and Christians second. And I know it's just semantics, but I really wish we would say we are Christian Americans. We are Christians who happen to live in America. And we're members of a kingdom that has no borders. That's not locked in any earthly confinement. We're called to be Christians first and Americans second. And let me for a minute just be very direct here. There are many people in this room who live this out really well. People that you can look up to. People that are Christians first and Americans second. People who, as faithful followers of Christ in this room, this fall, will vote Republican, and others will vote Democrat. And because they have that order correct, they are still, their allegiance is still with God. It's not about voting one way or another that's going to mess, mess you up with God. It's about when you get that order wrong. As long as you put Christ first, everything else flows from there. In my reading, I found this, this uh, project, this exercise to be very helpful, and you may need to do it. It'll be on the screen. I vote blank, your political party, but I am deeply disappointed by their position on blank. And here's the deal. If you can't fill out that second, that second part, 
your allegiance might be in trouble. If you cannot differentiate yourself at all from a political party, your allegiance is in trouble. As Christ followers, we should have some distance between us and the people we vote for, us and the political party we may or may not support. And if we are completely in line, you need to go back and check your allegiance. But I know if you, again, are like me, we need these reminders. We need these things that will help us. And one of the things I would love to start with is, it comes from this quote. I propose we move from, you can't be a true Christian if you vote for blank, to you can't be a true Christian if you don't follow the Sermon on the Mount. Church, the Sermon on the Mount is where Jesus gives his vision for what it means to be a kingdom person, what it looks like to live in his kingdom, and we have to live out of that. Another way to say it is that if he is our Lord, if he is our king, that's his rule. That's his agenda for us. For those of us who have confessed Jesus as Lord, we are agreeing to play under a different set of rules. We've given up one way of life for another. But we need a daily practice, something that will recenter us on Jesus. And so maybe you need to go through that exercise I gave you before to understand how it is that you want to be different than any one political party. Here are some other ideas. You might should start and end the day with the Lord's Prayer. Some people call it the the Jesus Prayer, but I'm going to use its traditional term today, the Lord's Prayer. And when you pray it, you are again confessing who your Lord is. Starting and ending your day with that is going to change your day. The second idea, I, I almost put read through the Sermon on the Mount weekly, and I thought, you know what, for many of us, that's not going to be enough. But you might daily need to spend time in those three chapters, Matthew chapter 6, 5, 6, and 7. That you need to start there and anchor your soul in what it is that Jesus says you should be about before you go anywhere else and let the world tell you what you should be about. If you are the kind of person who journals, maybe you need to sit down and you need to say, what does it mean when I say Jesus is Lord? How will it impact my life choices? Maybe you need to think back on some of the big decisions you've made over the last year or few years. And maybe you need to be honest with where where your confession, Jesus is Lord, came into play and where it didn't. Where you did not even consider your confession in making a big decision. But we live out of our confession of who Jesus is first. Or maybe you need to go and you need to just journal about areas where you are tempted to be to be more in line with the world than with Jesus. And that's a place where we start and we pray a prayer of repentance. Because you are called to be a Jesus follower first and foremost. Now, this is, this is going to be a silly example, but I think it happened here, actually. There's someone here who I know who, who I think would identify as, as a Cowboys fan. And then there was another Sunday that they said, you know, Uh, Well, today I'm pulling for the Eagles. And I said, it just doesn't work like that. (laughs) If you have confessed allegiance to the Cowboys, you cannot root for the Eagles. Can I get an amen? Amen. (laughs) That's a silly example, but it highlights exactly what I'm saying. Is that we have pledged our allegiance to one king, and his name is Jesus. And everything in our life flows from that first. Maybe today you want to respond to this sermon somehow. Our shepherds and their wives are going to be around the room, and we offer this invitation each and every Sunday. But you may come in here today and you go, you know what, in this season, I have a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry about what may happen. I have a lot of concern for our country or for the world, and and I would say, then you turn to God in prayer with that. That for many of us, we need the body of Christ. I think God established his church for a reason. For when we drift in our allegiance, when we start to live by a different agenda, a different set of rules, that we need the body of Christ to surround us and bring us back to center. As I put before you, I want you to start and end your day with the Lord's Prayer. And so as we close today, would you please be standing as we pray this prayer together? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen.